Um, I think I just want to uh, repeat that what we're going to do is divide this into two sections. We're going to go, we only have 25 minutes. So, <laughs> so we're going to go very quickly. Um, Uliya selected some highlights from his collection, but they actually track quite nicely um, the history so far of contemporary uh, Chinese art. Um, but really, you'll have to strap on your seatbelts. This is quite different from what you've seen <laughs> so far in the last two days. Um, so we're very excited, and after which we'll have a conversation. But we'd really like also to open it up to questions. Um, so feel free to ask questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Inge and uh, Jane, uh, for this introduction, which made me think that I should not have spent so much time doing all these unnecessary things. Then your introduction would have been shorter, and we could see more images. <laughs> so. Why don't we start with them? Uh, we, we follow more or less the timeline and we try to cross the media. Uh, we can't show video, but you will uh, get an idea of contemporary art and then we can go into discussion. Uh, this is not exactly contemporary art. Why do I show it? Uh, I think it's very important uh, to understand the first generation of Chinese contemporary artists to know where they come from. They have grown up with this type of imagery of uh, cultural revolution art, socialist realism, and this has really uh, for long been their only source. Of course, there has been traditional art, but had been pushed away in education. For long, this was what they grew up with. Of this particular painting, millions of posters were drawn. It shows uh, Mao uh, on inspection of the Guangdong province. Chairman Mao didn't feel comfortable in the south. It was his only trip there. So this is a significant painting also in that sense. The education uh, came from originally romantic, uh, realism of Europe through Moscow, uh, socialist realism to then China and the academies also focused very much on figurative painting and we will see therefore another impact of this kind of imagery that figurative work was quite dominant. Here we will look at two works from 1979. 79 is the beginning of Chinese contemporary art, and these two works were in the very first, uh, very important exhibition of what we may call experimental or contemporary art in China. Uh, this is a painting, and again, this is a sculpture. Uh, we may uh, all agree that these two works did not contribute to the global discourse of contemporary art, and in that sense were quite, or are quite insignificant. But if we talk about Chinese contemporary art history, these works are very important. They led to uh, enormous heated debates at the time in this exhibition, 79, which was outside of uh, the outside of the National Museum because they were not allowed inside the artists at the time and the, the people debated you know how could it be that somebody would do such a bold uh, image of uh, what, what is the heavy hand of the carter on the mouth of the simple Chinese uh, in that case uh, they were debating you know how could somebody represent something which is not real they were thinking these elongated figures are uh, not, you know, a state of the art. And so that kind of debate. We may also see that art at that time was a kind of derivative of Western art rather than uh, art of its own. We may now um, jump forward to the second half of the 80s. Second half of the 80s, and most experts would agree, by that time, the Chinese artists have found to a language of their own. And this is a group of works, a seminal group of works, which uh, was shown in this uh, one and only nationwide contemporary art exhibition. 
in Beijing, in the National Museum of Beijing. And actually, these four works were the ones that were publicized all over China, even internationally, as an indication of what kind of art at the time prevailed. Uh, here, again, we see uh, art of this very early pop type, which then <laughs> later is developed and, and further exploited in works we may see now. Uh, here we jump into the early 90s. This was after 89, Tiananmen. Uh, it led to the end of uh, what was considered a, a period of relative freedom until 89. And the artists uh, sort of resignated, turned to different topics. Uh, Earlier on, it was about building the new China. The artists wanted to play a role in that. Uh, but here, the school of uh, what later was called um, cynical, cynical realism. Thank you, Jane. Uh, this is one of these examples where we see the young, uh, kind of rookie Chinese young generation and we see the old China uh, in, in front of his eyes, and we see that they don't communicate. This is a similar type of work. We see another one of what now has been, have been considered the important four artists, as they are called in China, and the artists who made the market and who are still about amongst the highly priced artists, Yue Minchun, Fang Lichun, Zhang Xiaogang, similar type of concept at the time, Zheng Fang Chu. Uh, so they are all representing this school. Then we see more of this uh, political pop. Actually, this became the cover of the Time magazine, 99, uh, 50 years of People's Republic of China, but uh, all the copies were confiscated in China because, uh, yeah. We, uh, we see across other media objects like this one, torture uh, being exerted from, uh, unlike in the past, through wars and weapons, through the desk, really. So it's uh, authoritative power from the desk. Then we see other type of media, performance media. Uh, here, the artist Wang Qing um, putting this segment, this, uh, um, how to say, red color uh, into the river. Uh, the, the, the blood flooding through uh, the province to the sea. We see another performance here. Uh, one of the earliest works about the environment in China female artist, uh, she freezes the water of this local river in a local village and we see then the inhabitants cleaning the water of their own river and thus realizing the state of the water. Then we come to works that are more indicative of consumerism which start to dominate Chinese society. We see uh, then photo becoming also important medium during the 90s before uh, it has not been used in the art context rather as a documenting medium but uh, more and more artists then uh, moved into medium in as photo as medium here's another such example uh, here we have works and we see two or three more works uh, an interesting turn of the contemporary artists to their own tradition. And uh, in the 80s, you would not see artists who would turn to the Chinese tradition. They were fascinated by Western concepts, by conceptual art, etc. But over time, they got disillusioned by these Western concepts. They saw that they also do not provide all the answers. And so many artists turn back to tradition to find inspiration or find a new resource. This is one example. This is another example from Mambo. This is a painting 
the artist and I, we developed together for an exhibition I had in mind. It had to do with the fact that the young generation in China uh, is not paying attention anymore. I'm not talking beyond artists to their own tradition. And we were thinking of a way how to get the generation interested, uh, which would not look at the old scroll, but maybe uh, having grown up with a computer, find a new fascination. So we de developed this painting back and forth, and the whole code of Shan uh, Shui you may find in, in, in different ways, which I cannot explain here, from the perspective to calligraphy, etc., etc. Uh, this is another work by, this is a work by Ai Weiwei, again, has to do with the tradition. The objects may be dearer to your heart uh, than others, but uh, maybe not what he accomplished with this works. It's altogether 132 Neolithic vases and about one-fourth he covered with white industrial paint. It's about this clash of the Chinese tradition, Chinese culture with Western industrial culture overpowering China in the 80s, 90s. This is a work, uh, another school of thought more. Uh, it's actually a, a 14 meter long silk scroll and the artist, again female artist, she spent one year every day sitting down scribbling these uh, small black squares on this long, long scroll. This is uh, contemporary calligraphy in the eyes of this artist. Um, we may perceive it as an abstract work, but actually this artist only works with either characters or fragments of characters. And uh, like many of these contemporary artists dealing with culture, with tradition, sometimes they fall between categories, like by the contemporaries he would be considered a calligrapher, by the calligraphers he would be considered a contemporary, so he has no home in the end. Uh, this is an installation, again, about calligraphy calligraphy garden, uh, the whole thing, the waterfall composed of calligraphies underneath, and uh, there is a pond, so various elements, again, of a Shan Shui work in there. Again, an artist group playing with the tradition. Then we have a more, uh, you are smiling, this is another school of thought uh, where artists uh, deal with, say, the, the reality of China, which at times uh, can be uh, quite brutal. It's a pillar made of human fat, and uh, there was a period where artists did a lot of works with uh, body parts, uh, actually works which could not be shown in the West. Uh, this is a very mild version of, of this particular school, and uh, of course, they have to do with uh, this destruction of, of, of civilization and culture in many ways in China, in contemporary China. They deal with taboos, but it also indicates that their taboos are very different from ours. There are such works, they were shown actually, they were exhibited in China, but could not be exhibited in the West. This is just a a sculpture, happens to be my home, uh, it's about size. This is another element. Uh, the Chinese artists, they work bigger, bigger, and bigger, and uh, very much opposed, for instance, as Japanese contemporary artists. So it, it shows another kind of school of thought. This is yet another work uh, about aging society, about age installation, moving parts. Uh, you can actually move in this installation as a viewer and they will pass by by a very sophisticated computer control. I conclude with this particular work. Uh, this is yet another medium, the R&B City, work by the female artist Cao Fei. And it's another kind of experiment, and also in collecting. It's a second life, virtual word type artwork. 
it poses this very interesting question to the collector as to what is the collectible in such a piece? Is it, is it a data bank? Is it objects uh, that originate from uh, this work? Is it uh, photos, images, videos that are produced? Maybe I must elaborate. This is an island, in, in a virtual island, virtual world within Second Life. And you can uh, animate it with uh, exhibitions in there. You can use this spaces for exhibitions, for uh, other uh, artist activities. You as a viewer uh, have to uh, buy an avatar, so to speak. With this avatar, you can navigate through this island, look at the works. So to summarize, uh, you may see that the contemporary artists use all media in a very postmodern way. There is no clear trend, anything is possible. Now, <laughs> I want to give back to you, Chen. I urge everybody to have questions, because I'm sure a lot of this work is somewhat puzzling um, and very, very varied. But, um, Uli, one of the things is that you were, you are, the largest collector or the collector of most objects, I would imagine now, although that's um, perhaps changing with some of the energy that's happening in China at the moment. But you started very early um, compared to other collectors, particularly collectors that have begun since 2000 um, and since the, the rise in the art market. What drew you to collecting Chinese art? You collected Western art before, but what drew you to collecting? And do you remember your first major acquisition uh, in China? Uh, I had been a collector of Western art before, so it was just natural for me to look around in my new environment, see what artists were doing. Also, I was very much confined, you know, 1979, 80, uh, by what I could see and uh, hear about Chinese realities, and I was aware I need some other source of information, and I hoped that contemporary art would provide that information. So that was a main reason why I got into it. And then when uh, looking and searching for the art all over China, uh, I realized at some point that nobody uh, was collecting Chinese contemporary art, not even in a remotely systematical way, neither individual nor institution. So. Uh, I thought, this is very odd. This is the biggest cultural space in the world, yet nobody cared what the contemporary artists were doing. Uh, so since nobody was doing it, I thought self-assigned mission in a way to create this document, which is missing in the world. So that's why I collect in such a, I don't know how you would want to call it, such an un irrational, unreasonable way. I don't know whether it's irrational or unreasonable, but we're very glad that you did because it is a document. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about when you encountered the artists, what the conditions were like, where they were working, how they responded to you? Of course, this was a, a dramatic change over time. Uh, I must say, so if I compare to the collecting situation of what we now have heard during two days, which was very interesting for me, uh, there, were, there was no dealer system in China when I started. I had to do my own research. I had to go find the artists. Uh, and to answer your question how I started, somebody introduced me to an artist. That artist would introduce me to another artist. Uh, so I would go around. I would see more and more. Then uh, at some point, the situation flipped. The artist. Uh, learned about this crazy individual who would you know, want to know more about what they were doing and even buy what they were doing. So they started to search for me. I also established this art award at a time when there was no transparency in China about what was being created. There was no internet. There were no books at the time because uh, there were no galleries. The galleries were not allowed to do books about much of this art, which was considered very controversial. So only go there myself 
would really help me. So uh, through this art award, I got a lot of material, which then again would increase my knowledge, and that's how I built the collection. Then at some point, the dealers came along, auction houses, uh, but still 98% of what I collect, I collect from the artists themselves. Were there certain artists um, who you felt, I mean, you, you, you've you collected a, a great um, variety of works and mediums and artists, um, and I know that you've said to me before, this is a document, you collected what there was. Um, however, I feel that there, you didn't collect everything that there was, you couldn't have, um, and you had to make selections. Um, in the beginning, did you have a strategy? And as it developed, did that, that plan or strategy change? Were there certain things that you were looking for specifically that attracted you and you thought were important? Well, I started out as a private collector, you know, who would uh, collect according to his, her own particular taste. But once I realized that this document I was referring to doesn't exist, I completely changed my focus put my taste in the background, and I try to uh, reproduce the whole specter of what the Chinese artists were doing. So when a topic had a certain relevance at the time and artists dealt with it, then it would have a place in my collection. So I collected as an institution would collect, much rather than as a private collector would collect. Was it Mr. Freer who had a, a, a two lives, one as a private collector and another as someone who had an, uh, perhaps an institution in mind? Um, looking back at your collection, though, do you see certain themes? Because um, you were at, in China at the moment, so you were responding to something at the moment and perhaps didn't have time to reflect on um, how they fit into a historical trajectory. Do you see certain themes that have developed that have become more apparent to you as um, you as time has passed that wouldn't have been apparent at that time? Um, again, as an institutional collector, I consider my collection more material. This material would allow you to follow very different trajectories. Uh, as here is an image or what I discussed earlier, like you could do an, an, an exhibition about what the contemporary artists do about shan shui. You could do a calligraphy exhibition. You could do uh, an exhibition about art in Shanghai or from Shanghai. So I see it as material, as an accumulation of material of a certain minimal quality. And then, you know, curators or myself could make their choices. your um, exhibition, or you traveled your collection in, in different exhibitions, and those exhibitions have been curated at, by different people at different, at different times. Um, can you talk a little bit about the public reaction to your collection, um, both the, collection, uh, the exhibition I saw in Bern, um, and then I also saw the rendition that was done in California at Berkeley. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the sort of Western uh, reaction to your, to your collection? Uh, in the early days, like uh, early 2000, uh, of exhibiting, the idea was to bring uh, overviews, overviews to the world, because uh, yes, there have been Chinese exhibitions, contemporary of contemporary art, but uh, most uh, very uneven uh, projects. You know, some interesting, some less interesting uh, exhibition or works in an exhibition. Uh, due to the way these exhibitions were normally formed, they were not really made by scholars of, of Chinese art or Chinese contemporary art, but more by the uh, gatekeepers of contemporary art, which are predominantly Western and which are not knowledgeable about Chinese art. So uh, these overviews have been done more, say, by myself in a sense that I had time to, to select works. I had the opportunity to select works earlier than other people 
directly from the artist. I did not curate these overview uh, exhibitions. Actually, they caused a debate at some times, particularly by the Chinese, saying, you know, this is not Chinese contemporary art, this is political art. To a degree, it's true because I had Western curators making these choices, and uh, so they reflect very much what Western curators were thinking a Western audience would want to see. Uh, but as I said, the material is there. You could also do an exhibition, you know, which would cater to a specifically Chinese taste, if that were the idea. But mainly the exhibitions were selected by Western people. But I must add, the, these exhibitions were very successful in, it, in terms of they drew very large audiences, and some of several of those uh, have drawn the largest audience these institutions had for contemporary art. They may not compete, you know, with uh, some uh, how do you say some real, you know, uh, Picasso shows, but out of the contemporary, they were the most successful. Later. Uh, focus more on special topics, just like, for instance, this Shan Shui. Um, perhaps you can speak a little bit about the Shan Shui exhibition that um, I saw in Lucerne that is a very interesting exhibition because it deals with this connection to tradition and given the audience we have here and given the collectors and collecting habits um, of many uh, benefactors to Western institutions, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about you, that exhibition and um, how you formulated it and what you what you see in in the material there. Actually, what impressed me most was that my current came twice to Lucerne to see that exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> so, but talking about the exhibition, uh, it I consider it a platform uh, which allows for a debate how the contemporary artists approach tradition. Uh, some see themselves within this tradition and continuing the tradition. Others feel, yes, we are within that tradition, but we need to give it a new breath. Others feel we are outside. They may look at it and say, uh, it's a beautiful dream, but you know, does not refer to today. Uh, others may say, it's just a corpse, doesn't, you know, it's not useful. So, and others completely, uh, how to say, completely separate from this tradition. They may just do work about landscape. So the idea was more present such a platform and uh, yeah, allow for a debate. My impression, impression has always been that in the United States, um, uh, collectors of contemporary China, to the extent that there are any at all, and uh, there are very, very few actually, for various reasons, um, have always looked to the connection with the tradition um, and have um, been uh, fascinated with artists like Xu Bing or Tsai Guochang or uh, Xu Bing and Tsai Guochang again and again, <laughs> um, uh, who are obviously very important artists, uh, Gu Wenda, uh, artists who have worked within the tradition. Um, uh, even the, the pieces that, that uh, were shown um, with Mike's uh, uh, recent acquisitions, we had Zhang Yu who works with ink in an abstract way, and we have Zhang Wan who works with uh, steel rocks. But what I found quite remarkable about, remar remarkable about your collecting is while that features as a portion of your collecting, um, the point of departure I think was quite different from that. You came with a very different perspective um, on contemporary Chinese art, and I think what enabled you to uh, reach out much farther um, in terms of the oil painting and installations. Can you talk a little bit about your response to some of those works uh, when you first saw them that were not in the Chinese tradition or in the Chinese ink pre-modern tradition? Actually, my main interest is, was and is in works created in the energy of, of current China, of today China. It wasn't so much about collecting art uh, from a yellow face, so to speak, cynically. And uh, my interest uh, was therefore more on the artists living in China. And uh, there is always interesting debate about the artists you mentioned, uh, about in particular their earlier works, playing the Chinese card, as some people may feel. 
and uh, not being so much in tune in what the art, what art is produced in Chinese society today. So there are various ways of looking at it. I, I do have some works from them to illustrate, you know, that phenomenon. Them being a very clever, a very good strategists, I think, in the Western world. Uh, of course, also being good artists. Uh, so, yes, there is some of that to document it, but that's not my main interest. around um, the diaspora artists and particularly artists who came to China, who came to the United States in the late 80s, early 90s, who um, were able, and I wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm slightly more sympathetic to their plight, and I think it relates also very much to an American situation where these artists were arriving at a moment of globalization or when globalization was sort of becoming coined a phrase in, in the United States and, and sort of entering in with the possibility of, of adding, expanding, or developing the discourse around identity politics, being Chinese in America, being an immigrant in America, dealing with issues of communication, just lack of communication or difficulties of communication, and using Chinese materials to make that their identity apparent, um, but in a way that could cross uh, cultural boundaries is something that I think didn't it wasn't necessarily played well in America, but was adding to a discourse that was already developed and developing in the United States. So some of those artists became very popular here and have continued to practice here, which I think is quite relevant to a discourse of, of marginality and identity politics and things like that in the United States. Clearly, that is not an issue that was particularly relevant inside China. Um, it, was an, it, was a inter, it was a transnational issue rather than an issue internal to China. Um, but I, you know, I do think that that your perspective on on uh, contemporary art very early on, I was very aware of American uh, uh, observers, uh, collectors, or interested people being very uh, repelled by <laughs> the kind of art that you were collecting, <laughs> um, and and rejecting it. And to this day, actually rejecting it as as Chinese. Um, I want to point everybody. There was a very interesting uh, interview that you did in, in your mahjong a catalog about what is Chinese. And you interviewed lots and lots of artists as whether they, what, what it means to be Chinese or what art means to be Chinese. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that. That was a fascinating interchange and, can, and, and, and very open-ended, so I'd... Uh, well, for the book of that exhibition, Ma Zhong was the title, uh, I asked the participating artists, actually there were about 100, but about 50 responded, and I asked them, uh, is there something like Chineseness? If yes, what is it? And if there is, do you purposely employ it in your art? Do you purposely avoid it in your art? Or is it just not relevant? Or is this a stupid question? And uh, of course, there's no, absolutely no consensus on this. And uh, you know, some artists wrote back, "What is Swissness in art? You know, do you purposely avoid Swissness, etc." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was just a very, very interesting topic. And uh, well, yeah, one could go on very long. You know, if there is something like Chineseness, and what is it? Um, I think we're um, coming towards the end. We've got a couple, uh, maybe. Maybe we should look forward um, in terms of your own collecting and in terms of what's happening in China today. I noticed that a number of these works, I think the last work is 2008, we're now in 2012. Um, that's not to say that your collecting has stopped in any way, but what do you s see, where do you see contemporary Chinese art going? That's a very complicated question. People ask me that all the time and I cringe when people do. Where do you see contemporary ch Chinese art going? Or maybe more particularly where you're collecting is going, what interests you? I'm uh, currently, or since a while, interested in, in two things. One is this turn to tradition I was briefly talking about, which uh, is a fairly recent phenomenon uh, which produces very interesting results. And the second thing is, uh, maybe I must explain, we have this contemporary Chinese art, you know, which uh, departs from a very specifically different point in the 
late 70s to today, and we have this global mainstream, which we all know, you know, these 200 artists maybe who dominate and who we see everywhere in all auction catalogs, every, collect, every collection we go, every institution, not every, but most, we see the same uh, things. We can debate, do they have the better Richter or the bigger Soluit, but uh, they are very uniformous. And now we see this global contemporary art and the Chinese contemporary art emerge because the artists who led a distinctly different life, you know, even 10 years ago from their peer, international peers living in New York and London now live a comparable life and have access to the same information and uh, spend maybe even their days same way. They travel, they have all the books. So uh, right now in front of our eyes, we see this merging of these two streams. And I'm very interested in what that means. Does it mean Chinese art will be swallowed up? Does it mean Chinese art will have an impact on this global art? Is it an endangered species or, or you know, what's happening? So say my collecting goes to represent that particular situation. These are some of them. And then I, um, I'm very interested in what the very young artists do because my means are finite and that's about what one can afford to collect of Chinese contemporary art now. Well, on, just on that note, just there's, um, in terms of affording to collect Chinese contemporary art, it's very difficult these days. There's a new, new group of collectors in the market um, being Chinese themselves. This was not true when, when Uli started. Um, and that is now, it's very, very true now. Um, it'll be interesting how this force and this amount of money is going to, again, help shape taste and help shape developments in contemporary art. We wait and see. I think that's a very interesting phenomena. Anyway, if anyone has any questions, otherwise, uh, we have a question right here. We have lots of questions. Um, how much of your collection is installation art and video art, and how do you handle something? How do you use this? What kind of space does that take? Uh, it's a very good question because the, no Chinese artist thinks of the collector's burden in that respect. Um, I would say maybe 60% is painting and maybe 20%, 30% is installation, objects, sculpture, maybe 10% is, you know, video, yeah, photo work, something like that. It, it sort of uh, mirrors the art production in China. And of course, need the storage. Many works are very, very large, ever larger. So that's yeah, the burden of the collector nowadays. I'd, I'd love it if you would tell us a little bit about the audience within China for this material, especially early on. Were, was there an audience? To whom were the artists? speaking, assuming they were not immediately speaking to an international audience, but to something more local? Of course, this changed over time. Um, we saw like 79. This, there was a very short window of opportunity to show it to a broader public. That window closed very soon uh, in early 80s. And then uh, this type of art was only seen by a very small circle of people. Academics, uh, the artists themselves, they gathered, Jane, <laughs> she saw it, they gathered together. An exhibition may last a few hours, maybe last a day, maybe last two days, then would be closed. So for very long, this, this was the contemporary or experimental art scene, but it started to change around 2000, I would say. Then all of a sudden, magazines appeared, uh, new magazines about art, people's magazines. The artists became public figures. Some artists became famous, became rich, became fancy. And uh, that drew a very different public. Uh, 
which we may see today, which is a kind of urban elite. Still, it's not a large public. It's, it's still comparatively small, but it's, it's by, by wide margins wider than before. And uh, it, it has reached a certain status, also uh, creating collectors who can now gain a certain status by collecting. This was not the case earlier on. Nobody would understand if, if you had some of these weird things on your wall. Also, there was no purchasing power by the Chinese public uh, to buy works. And Chinese living conditions were such that you, know, you didn't have walls to put something there. So all these things <laughs> came together. But all this is, is changing dramatically now, and of course, fortunes are being made and uh, investments were made in contemporary art and funds you know are are multiplying uh, so uh, it, it's a very different scene now What's your opinion of Chinese art schools, and do you think that contemporary uh, Chinese art is having an impact on them? Uh, the, the last part I didn't understand. Uh, your opinion of Chinese art schools, and do you think that contemporary Chinese art is having an impact on them and what they're teaching these students? Uh, the education system still lags somewhat behind in, in uh, the development of the contemporary art. But uh, say we have some encouraging signs, like uh, an artist like Xu Bing now become the vice dean of uh, Central Academy. Uh, we have other contemporary artists now reaching that type of maturity that they can that they are invited to the art schools. But they are all quite frustrated, and uh, they, they may or may not express this frustration in public because it's still very bureaucratic and. The whole system is still very much skill-based and not so much uh, based on art thinking, but much rather on acquiring technical skills. So this is, there is a only a very gradual change in this. I think that maybe we'll, is there one more? What was your idea establishing a private museum, first private museum in China? You mean? Yes, your, your own museum. Uh -huh. I don't have the intention to establish my own museum in China. Uh, I'm, I'm more in support of public museums, but this is a very complex topic, you know, whether Chinese public museums would be in a position to house a collection of contemporary art with a lot of works that are considered a highly critical and official chain China uh, does not appreciate because they do not represent China in the way that official China would want itself to be represented. This is still a big topic. <laughs> 